Thor Heyerdahl, the grand explorer. He looks somewhat like the movie star Kirk Douglas, some say. Axel um, Anderson's recent biography calls him a hero for the atomic age as the post-World War II crisis and the early days of the Cold War. He was a distraction from the death, the Marshall Plan, the Nuremberg trials. The world had just come out of a horrific world war with millions of deaths, a slow recovery, and the public was just getting back on their feet. Due to his knack for using the media for his own purposes, writing skills, use of photography and film, Heyerdahl became one, if not the most famous person on earth for a time. A master of public relations and a master of self-promotion. Um, and question authority was his mantra for life. The goals of this presentation is to consider the scholarly context of the times when Thor Heyerdahl came up with his theory and undertook research on a wide variety of issues and locations. Uh, a short introduction to migration and diffusion as an old and problematic theme in archaeology, indigenous navigation in the Americas, to look at Heyerdahl's theory of a unified humanity, and a brief summary of the Contiki expedition and its implications, some of his field work at Easter Island, and looking at some new research um, that seems to actually back up many of his ideas. Um, and I realize this is probably one of the first lectures that at least I've given here in a long time that isn't about gold or treasures. So I asked myself, why am I giving a presentation about Thor Heyerdahl in Polynesia? And I realized I do have some connection to many of the issues raised in Heyerdahl's research and writing. My formative years were when Thor Heyerdahl and other explorers were highly visible in the world media. I never got to hear Thor Heyerdahl speak, but I heard many explorers in a travelogue lecture series when I was growing up in Richmond, Virginia. Um, part of the reasons why I wanted to become an archaeologist, probably around the sixth grade, was because of Thor Heyerdahl and others, especially the archaeologists like Hiram Bingham, Howard Carter, and Heinrich Schliemann that I read about and um, developed kind of a naive and somewhat romantic view of archaeology at an early age. My interests overlap with Thor Heyerdahl, number one, in his love and the, of indigenous knowledge, astronomy, navigation, engineering, technology, architecture, and the labor organization for construction of monuments. Um, experimental archaeology is one of my things that I do, and it was, I think, the first course I took as an undergraduate at Washington University. We went out to a forest and cut a tree down with a stone axe. And um, I found out very quickly by doing, actually doing that experiment, you find out kind of what it was like. Um, you see, yes, it can be done, but it's not all that easy. Uh, we also built Mississippian houses. We lived in them at freezing temperatures, tanned hides, made pottery, and um, I, I didn't participate in it, but some colleagues made a dugout canoe. So um, this is some of my work in Bolivia on experimental archaeology as applied to um, indigenous agricultural systems that don't exist today, but using the archaeological record to reverse engineer them to find something about them. Um, also, uh, we've been involved in some reed boat experiments, and one of my students, Alexi Vranich, I'll show some of the images of one of his reed boats that he um, used in an experiment to move stones at Tiwanaku. Also interested in the big view of world prehistory, uh, beyond the site, the valley, the country, or even the region, studied by most archaeologists. Migration and diffusion is a big topic that I studied a lot in graduate school, um, and highlighting the good, the bad, and the ugly of some of the interpretations. And then also, the archaeology of movement, and my focus is more terrestrial or inland riverine systems. Heyerdahl's was more maritime, but the importance of things like the canoe, the raft, um, and the reed boat in, in shaping the history of the world, in particular the Americas. I realized the importance of water traffic uh, doing field work in the Bolivian Amazon. And the guys I work with, the guides um, that we take out in some pretty remote areas, they're always yelling at me, Clark, why don't you come back in the rainy season when we can skim our canoes across the whole countryside and not have to lug all your gear on our backs? Um, early at Nordschild many years ago, 
pointed out that all, pretty much all of South America, except the Andean region, is a giant aquatic highway. You can go from the Orinoco River, cross over the headwaters into the Amazon system, and from there going south across the Pantanal into the La Plata and um, down and through Argentina. A massive connection of water, water networks. It has you know, serious implications for the shaping of prehistory. Um, I'm probably a lot more open to a lot of these ideas of big movements of peoples. Um, having studied at the University of Illinois with Donald Lathrop, David Grove, and Tom Zeidema, who stressed the continent-wide view, and the connections um, can be documented by linguistics, by archaeology, by history, and also increasingly so by genetics. Migration, diffusion, and innovations. Um, so there's sort of two polar opposites. One is independent invention that's kind of very popular now that people throughout the world have basic needs. Um, they are adjusting to their local landscapes and they invent the things that they need. Often, many, many times, different times, sometimes contemporaneously throughout the world. The other view on the other end is the idea of diffusion and it's sort of the assumption is that something develops in one area and then spreads out. It's like ripples on a pond when you toss a pebble in the center of it. And um, this was very popular explaining the distribution of races and early anthropology and key traits that led to what we recognize as civilization. Unfortunately, many of these views um, view the center as being superior peoples, cultures, technologies, and practice, practices that overwhelm the peoples on the land um, rather than appreciating their own local adaptations and their own developments. In some extreme cases of hyper migration, hyper diffusionism, are some of the Victorian notions of the West as the center of the world, the Nazi science practiced by Germans and the Aryan superiority. Von Donegut's ideas about everything can be explained by extraterrestrial visitors to Earth. Um, and you know, these things, as we know, have political implications um, for rewriting um, histories in some cases and uh, impacting native claims on land and indigenous pride and also their accomplishments. And unfortunately, they often raise issues of racism. David Anthony, a Penn PhD, uh, many years ago, wrote a key article about migration. He said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And um, he was pointing to uh, the incredible studies of Indo-European languages and the spread of that and many cultural traits across broad areas of the old world. Um, and we can look at the spread of peoples and cultures throughout Africa, Amazonia, Oceania, and the Western United States as other examples. And today, these are addressed by multidisciplinary teams using archaeology, linguistics, ethnohistory, studying myth, oral history, genetics, geology, dating techniques, and good old-fashioned dirt archaeology, many of the things that um, Heyerdahl did. The art historian and anthropologist Mary Helms, um, writing about ancient Panama, um, recognized the importance that she found in the historical documents and some of the archaeological evidence of the importance of distant knowledge, as she called it, and long distance travel, where you had elites, priests, shamans um, that would travel long distances across multi-ethnic boundaries um, to sort of see the edges of the world. And to prove they've been there, they bring things back. And they also take things with them. And she explained a lot of the distribution, a lot of what we call prestige goods or preciosities in their archaeological record um, from long distance travel. We tend to underestimate how far people of the past traveled by foot, horses, mule, elephants, um, or even boats. And um, they were probably much more cosmopolitan than we give people credit for. Now, just to look at it quick, very quickly at an example of hyperdiffusionism um, as applied to um, the Americas. When I started graduate school, uh, my professor, Donald Lathrop, was involved with a heated debate with Dr. Betty Meggers of the Smithsonian Institute. And um, Betty Meggers and her colleagues had excavated a site on the coast of Ecuador, uh, right on the beach, and they found incredible pottery. This was in the 1950s. They 
did some radiocarbon dates, and the dates we now know go back as far as uh, 4,400 B.C. The early, at the time, it was the earliest pottery in the Americas. And it looked like the pottery was full-blown. It looked like it came out of nowhere. Didn't have any antecedents, didn't have any evolution from simple forms to these fancy ones. So Betty Meggers and her colleagues looked around the world. Where can we find early pottery that predates this? And they focused on Japan and the Jamon culture. Uh, we have the earliest pottery in, probably in the world, at least pottery vessels, and a very, very long tradition, and fishing folk, which have boats. So they explained the, the, this pottery, this find that they had, um, as a, sort of a freak journey of fishermen across the, the Pacific and shipwrecking in Ecuador and introducing the tradition of pottery. Now, pottery, sort of who cares, but it's an important element in the development of societies throughout the Americas. And so Donald Lathrop, Jim Zeiler, and Jorge Marcos cited, well, I, we think they're wrong because we found archaeological sites inland. Uh, these aren't fishermen. These are full-scale farmers, and over many years of research, you show that these were corn farmers, had most of the crops that peoples in the Americas used. And then they started to find other earlier pottery complexes in Colombia and also the central Amazon, predating it by as much as 1,000, maybe 2,000 years. And part of this was applying some techniques that the, gra the graduate and undergraduate students had learned doing Illinois archaeology of shovel scraping large areas, exposing villages. So this is a, a house floor of a large multifamily structure, uh, chock full of pottery and tells us a lot about the lifeways. And Valdivia culture um, has a long evolution that predates the finds that um, Betty Meggers and her colleagues found. And it was actually probably one of the first large villages um, with two ceremonial mounds, small and standards of late prehistory, but one of the first. Um, and this is the village probably about 3,000, 2,000 BC. Now, some key plants and animals um, that Heyerdahl and others have focused on, a lot of this research goes back to the 1800s um, and really became serious around 1930 and um, through the 60s or so. A couple of important things like the gourd and sweet potatoes. So we now know the gourd is probably the oldest domesticated plant in the world. Um, has wide distribution. Almost anybody that could grow it um, sort of requires a somewhat tropical environment um, spread throughout the world because of its usefulness for all kinds of things. You can see the different kinds of vessels you can get out of it for fish floats, storage, um, waterproof storage, all kinds of things. And um, so it's natural that people would pick this up and spread it around. Now, the problem with gourds is that um, the seeds can be eaten by a bird, and a bird could fly a long ways, poop it out, and you have the plant being spread in different areas. Um, so it could also float for long periods of time. They've done experiments on this. Um, so it's probably not the best candidate necessarily to definitely prove that humans have moved it around, although personally I believe that. The sweet potato is a different story. It doesn't float. And it shows up um, throughout the Americas very early, at least by 6,000 BC, maybe earlier. And it shows up in late prehistory all over Polynesia, well documented. Um, also, archaeologically, it's been dated to a context of about um, 1200 AD um, and carbonized remains in good archaeological context. So we definitely know that crop spread. And there's an interesting exchange over just the last two weeks. Two articles came out, one saying that the gourd genetics, so documenting all the genetics of the gourd varieties all over the world, say that it probably came from Asia, came across with the first peoples that crossed over into North America across the Bering Straits, maybe 12 to 15, 16,000 years ago brought with them dogs probably too, and spread it throughout the Americas and then later to Polynesia. Um, another article uh, says that it, it um, has genetic ties to Africa and not Polynesia, and it must have come from Africa. But what makes this exciting is all this new work and all this new energy being put with using essentially new techniques to document the movement of important crops throughout the world. 
This is also uh, combined with linguistic studies. And so you can kind of see here, even, at, at, no, I'm not a linguist, and you, probably you aren't either, but you can see the similarities in the names. Um, and so the name probably traveled with the plant, that means people. So Thor Heyerdahl. Most biographers um, are somewhat biased, and um, a lot of the biographers were his friends. And so it's kind of hard to sort of sort through the different, uh, to sort of get the, the real Thor Heyerdahl from a lot of these, um, these writings. Um, but all of them highlight him as a maverick and an outsider. Many biographies simply reproduce his text that he wrote himself from his many publications without serious critique. And his own books are very autobiographical in structure and argument, uh, strategically promoting himself for funding and his lifelong goal to convince the scholarly community that he was right. He was born in 1914 in Norway. His father was a master brewer, comes from a modest family. He had little or no money um, when he started the Kontiki expedition and um, survived uh, with a small family um, doing dock work um, various places in Canada and the United States. It's a sharp contrast to most of the explorers of the day that came from very wealthy families and were well-placed politically and socially. He studied um, zoology and geography for a few years, but never graduated with a degree from the University of Oslo, and spent considerable time in a private library in Norway with the world's best collection of books and articles on Oceania. And this is where he got, began to get his ideas and spark his interests in experimental archaeology, travel, and explaining unity of culture. Um, on a small expedition sponsored by two of his professors, he traveled to Fatahiva Island in the Marquesas in 1936 with his young wife. They sort of went native for a few years, um, took lots of pictures, wrote a lot, and visited a lot of archaeological sites on the island and nearby islands, beginning to form his ideas. And he had a strong appreciation for Polynesians, their life ways, incredible knowledge of the land and sea. During World War II, he served in the Norwegian Armed Forces briefly um, in Finland um, when Norway was occupied by the Germans. After the war, he was um, rejected by academia in New York City when trying to get his first book published. And this is when he was developing his ideas about the context of Polynesian South America. And it really hurt him because he wanted to have this book out in the English-speaking world. Um, most of the major figures that he visited, trying to convince them to publish it, dismissed him and his ideas. This was a turning point in his life, in philosophy of life. He considered himself a maverick outsider to the scholarly world from then on. Thor Heyerdahl's theory, I can't, he's written books about this, but I'll try to summarize it very, very briefly. Um, so the key elements are there was a race of white gods that migrate from the Middle East to the Americas, skipping Africa. They build monumental works and create civilizations in the Andes and civilize the dark-skinned indigenous peoples. After some time, a great battle occurred in Lake Titicaca, Highland Bolivia today, and a small fair-skinned group escapes to the Ameri um, escapes the Americas under the leadership of the bearded white leader, sun god, Wiracocha, or Contiki, using rafts and sailing west with the prevailing winds and the currents to Polynesia, spreading civilization there around AD 500. Um, and this contradicted all views of most archaeologists that Polynesia was settled from Southeast Asia across Melanesia. This is um, the site of Tiwanaku in Bolivia, and according to the Andean myths that he's drawing upon very selectively, um, they explain the stone monuments here. Is Viracocha got mad at the local people and turned them into stone. That's why we have this archaeological site. Um, an early depiction of Viracocha, who was actually the creator god for Andean peoples, and probably the myths were meant to tell you about proper life and behavior and a little bit less about literal history that Thor Heyerdahl um, used it for. We know quite a bit about boats from the historical record, lots of eyewitness accounts, um, but little direct archeological evidence in anywhere in the world. 
Um, Australia was colonized by 40,000 years ago, um, so we know they had to have gotten there by some kind of sea craft. Early peopling of the Americas, even though they crossed the Bering Straits, had to cross large wetlands, lakes, go along coasts, um, cross rivers, and so we assume that they had boats very, very early in the Americas. Um, but boats are not very well preserved. Types of boats documented for the Pacific coasts under discussion here, dugout canoes, rafts, skin boats like kayaks and whale boats, um, also reed boats, and the sewn plank boat, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Balsa wood is a very lightweight wood that we're, many of you are familiar with. Um, if you built models in the 1950s and 60s, um, and it's very workable wood and also incredibly buoyant and excellent for rafts and was used by pre-Columbian peoples. We think very early, but we only have the historical data, uh, eyewitness accounts. So one of our best accounts is from um, Bartolome Ruiz, who um, was kind of scouting ahead on the second expedition of Pizarro before he encountered the Inca Empire. And they were off the coast. Um, they intercepted a large ocean-going raft out of sight of the land, big sails carrying tons of produce, 20 crew members on board. And um, the Spanish were so happy to find this because it had lots of gold and some silver on it. That was the first that they'd encountered south of Mexico. And um, they threw most of the people overboard, drowned them, took three of them as hostages. I think they let a couple, couple loose on shore. Took them back to Mexico, learned how to use them as translators. And probably one of the reasons why Pizarro had such success of conquering the Inca Empire with 160 conquistadors was because they had control of the language. And th these, these sailors were using Quechua probably as a lingua franca. And they were heading north. We don't know exactly where, but it could be Central America. It could be the west coast of Mexico. We have other accounts, uh, especially a 1748 account by two Spanish naval officers. So the people that are going to be seeing these boats out on the ocean are going to be sailors. They know a lot about boats. So they pick up very quickly observations about what they like about these boats and what they think is, is great about them. And so they talk about especially um, the large, incredibly large cloth sails, probably made of cotton in most cases. Um, large cargo capacity, unsinkable, and the maneuverability of these large flat rafts. A lot of the Spanish and other Europeans didn't have any clue as to how you would actually navigate something like this. Um, there was one account of one showing up 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador near the Galapagos Islands. And um, so from a lot of these descriptions, we can tell something about um, the details that could actually maybe be put into reconstructing these. And that's exactly what Thor hired all did. He went through these accounts very carefully and developed sort of his best guess at how, guess at how these things work. Note on this one, um, it's got actually a garden in the back there, a little kitchen garden. Uh, they're growing plants there on this boat. We also know they probably carried live animals in some cases, like llamas um, for meat. There have been many studies, um, some of this done by Heyerdahl and others later, especially the study by Duan and Hostler on the engineering of these boats based on the eyewitness accounts and the simple drawings the Spanish gave us. And the key thing here to steer these is you need these center boards. And they, we know they had multiple center boards that could be pulled up and down as needed to keep the thing, give it some drag in the back to keep it going in the direction that you want. And then a very flexible sail that you can kind of tip in various directions by a long cord um, to kind of steer the thing. And then in the back, a long uh, steering oar or rudder that was used um, to stabilize and also steer. Most boats along the Pacific coast, especially the Andean region, are reed boats. And these are modern ones used by local fishermen. They're kind of like um, little surfboards, unsinkable. They go out, usually one person on a boat, working in pairs, set nets, maybe traps on the bottom of the ocean, and bring them in and sell them to the major cities in Peru. And we have archaeological depictions of these, although very schematic. Um, it's obviously a typical reed boat. Um, there's a two-person one, maybe a larger one over on the right from museum collections. But they don't show sails. And it'd be almost impossible to, set, to depict a 
detailed sail in a pottery vessel such as this. So maybe those kinds of things were stripped off. Also some of the steering devices. This is some from our own collection. And I love this one on the left. It's a very simple boat, a stylized. It's got a guy there maybe with a shirt off, a little pouch around, maybe with his fishing gear, with a, a kayak-like um, um, paddle in the front. And then on the right, we see a raft, um, one of the Moche deities, um, with four people kind of swimming in the water, kind of guiding it with all kinds of sea, sea animals there, some real, some not. And um, there are all, all kinds of experiments that have been done. Now, one that I really like is my student, Alexi Branich, back in 2002, decided um, everybody had speculated that Tiwanaku peoples had moved rocks some 20 to 40 up to maybe 60 kilometers across Lake Titicaca. And some of these weighed 100 tons. So he did an experiment um, over about a year, year and a half. They built the largest boat that ever been built in Lake Titicaca, probably since prehistory. And they actually moved that 10 ton stone you can see there over on the left onto the boat and very easily navigated it with a sail and just a two day trip to the other end of the lake. This is um, it in sail. They didn't even need to use the full sail. The small sail actually worked perfectly. Now, just very quickly, I'd like to say the other side of this is the Polynesian connection. And we know quite a bit about Polynesian navigation from scholars like Ward Goodenough and Bill Davenport, who are professors and curators here um, of Oceania at the Penn Museum. And they wrote about navigation skills. Um, Bill was actually a, a sailor himself and had his own um, sailing vessel that he used every weekend. They knew the knowledge of the stars for navigation. They knew the um, rise and set of certain stars could tell them directions, seasons. They read waves and clouds um, to indicate where islands were and weren't, even if they're out of view. Study bird presence and their behavior. Study currents. And it had these elegant, elegant boats. Um, they're much more maneuverable probably than the Peruvian boats. And had these very simple maps where they could record the knowledge on these portable devices um, and take them with them on these long journeys. It would be interesting to sort of compare point by point the Polynesian and the South American raft traditions. I won't do that here. But um, I've kind of, in my sense of the readings, that, that you know, the Polynesians could go much faster and much more efficiently in their boats, They're very streamlined. They, we know they had incredible skills of finding tiny, tiny islands, little specks out in the Pacific Ocean. The South American boats, though, were larger, could carry more cargo, um, and were pretty much unsinkable. So let's move to the Contiki expedition. So Thor Heyerdahl finally got a little bit of funding. Most of it was from taking out big loans from his friends. He had no money of his own at that time. And um, he also got some help, uh, equipment especially from the US Army, who uh, essentially opened up one of their supply depots in Peru and gave him all kinds of survival gear and equipment, uh, radio and things like this were key to the success of the expedition. They went up to Guayaquil, Ecuador, and went into the forest there, the intact tropical forest, cut down their, um, their main logs. There were nine balsa trunks that they cut down, then shipped um, as a group down to uh, Callao, Peru, uh, the port of Lima. We're all familiar with balsa, or those of you that are older in, in the audience, probably familiar with you know, making models with balsa. Um, it's the same, same species, and very important in a number of industries uh, throughout the world. This is the construction of the raft um, in the port of Callao. Um, they used the, these main trunks as the main base of it, and then put cross pieces of the same material, built up a deck, and then built a little cabin on top of it that you'll see in a minute. Bringing the, the logs down to Lima, and then construction of the floors and the little shelter uh, which they slept in and um, inclement weather ate their meals. They sailed off. Well, not really. Uh, they were towed some 60 miles out uh, for safety reasons to get them out of the main shipping routes so they could then begin their journey. Some people point out this is kind of you know, not exactly proving anything if you, you know, can't get through the surf and get out on your own. Um, but they considered it a necessity. There were six um, person crew, uh, all Norwegians except for one Swede. Many of them had war experience in World War II, and some of them um, Thor had grown up with during his life. 
sailing out, um, one of the first things, would, would this thing float for a long period of time? And the great S.J. Lothrop, who was a distinguished figure in New York, uh, anthropologist, archaeologist, had decided and declared that the boat would sink after the balsa would absorb too much water. It did absorb water, but it lasted the trip and much longer afterwards. So the key here is looking at the known currents, and um, these can be used to help you. Also, the winds tend to be towards the west, so they tried to sail as much as they could up the Humboldt current to the north, and then from there, try to catch the tropical uh, currents going to the west, and then hopefully make landfall in Polynesia. It was a learning experience, uh, putting the sail up, controlling it, trying to protect it from getting blown away, getting ripped. Um, they were constantly taking it, putting it up, taking it down, depending on the weather, so not to destroy it or the boat. Um, and steering the boat was much more difficult than they had imagined. Part of this was they didn't quite understand all of the nuances of the centerboards that had been described in the early indigenous accounts, um, eyewitness accounts off the coast of Peru and Colombia and Ecuador. Daily life, um, a lot of it was just sort of sort of waiting, um, you know, try to keep out of the sun as much as they could. Um, but they were kept busy the whole time. Thor Heyerdahl had his uh, typewriter, and he was continually sort of pecking away at that, writing his diary, uh, which eventually became the book, Contiki. They found, uh, they, they brought l some 60 um, big jerry cans of water, and they lashed them to the deck. Um, and that, you know, some people say, well, if they'd use indigenous ways, you know, how, could they store that much water? They also brought some bamboo tubes where they sealed to show that they could actually bring water using indigenous techniques. Um, but food was never a problem. The boat, for some reason, the underside of it attracted lots of fish. And there was almost like a school of fish below the boat most of the time. You could almost, you know, literally reach in and grab them in some cases, like they did sometimes with sharks. See, one of the harvests here. Um, some people say, I, I don't know this nutrition so much, but you, you can actually, if you eat enough of this fish, you, well, you, know, you get your protein, but you also get a lot of liquid water out of this. It's not salt water. And um, so you know, at least you could cut back on your necessary supplies if you had access to the fish. They also got these spectacular photographs. Um, they brought, had um, uh, nice cameras. And they had a little um, uh, rubber raft that you blow up that they would go out sometimes kind of scary distances from the main raft to take uh, footage, sometimes actually using the movie camera. Another shot of that, you know, great shots to sort of show the boat um, from the perspective of um, uh, off the boat. And then after 101 days, um, they passed an island, and they realized the reefs were too dangerous, so they sort of skipped that island and landed on the next one. Um, this is in the... Um, Tuamotos um, island chain. It was an unoccupied island at the time. Uh, they crashed through the roof, destroying a lot of the bottom of the raft. Um, and um, they thought they'd lost everything and maybe human life. Um, but as they all gathered on the beach, they found they were all alive, good health. And they actually salvaged most of their food and their, most importantly, their radio gear so they could contact um, people to come and rescue them. Um, part of um, Thor Heyerdahl's intelligence was the camera and also a movie camera and bringing the radio. And the radio was probably brought for security reasons, in case they needed to be rescued, which would probably be impossible out in the open ocean. But every day they made contact with ham radio operators somewhere in the world, sometimes uh, government officials here and there, and the word would be passed to the local media, sometimes the international media. And uh, this is truly sort of the, the first reality show uh, probably in the world, where um, it went from something like page 15 on the New York Times to the front page over a very short period of time, tracking Thor Heyerdahl's movements. Um, and he, all the ra ham radio operators that helped him, he gave this little souvenir card there. Um, it provided the context. He also made a movie which came out very quickly after the film, shaky camera work, you know, not pretty grainy, but it won an Academy Award. It was very well attended and probably spread the word about Thor Heyerdahl's ideas uh, much faster than his book or other media. So he showed that this was possible, but did it actually happen? 
And so he spent most of the rest of his life doing some more experiments, crossing um, oceans, but he also uh, wanted to find the archeological evidence of this migration of peoples from South America to Polynesia and settling it. So he went to the Galapagos Islands, worked there for a while, not a great project. Then he went to Easter Island and spent almost two years there. Um, this time he brought three trained archeologists um, with him. So the reports that he wrote, big, thick, 400, 500 page, multi-volume books, um, incredible archeology, span mapping, all the stuff that sort of state of the art at the time, very impressive. Um, but if you read, there's a sort of a disjuncture between the archaeological account, this kind of, you know, very presenting the facts, this and that, you know, and talking off of the data, to his more popular writing that took a lot of leaps about what this meant. Um, here's some sort of spectacular kind of showy shots. You never, I don't think they'd ever let you do this today on Easter Island, you know, climb to the top. Um, probably for me, the most interesting thing of the work that they did there was the experimental archaeology. And... Um, you know, Thor always said, uh, you know, they, we knew nothing about Easter Island until I went there. Well, there were many projects before, and he drew upon the literature of the previous people. But the experiments were, I think, some of the first. And part of it was to kind of show the amount of labor that went in and how difficult it was to cut these monuments out of rock in the quarries using indigenous techniques um, that he sort of guessed at, how they dragged these across the landscape. And it was kind of to prove that this was so sophisticated that local peoples couldn't do it. It had to be this master race coming in from South America to teach them how. And the experiments actually kind of showed it was pretty easy. You put a lot of people together, some ropes, you put some sleds down and just drag it across these ready-made roads that Easter Islanders had built. He also did a number of um, journeys that you're probably familiar with. They got great coverage in National Geographic. Um, it was the Raw One and Raw Raw two expeditions on reed boats. And so this was to try to prove that Egyptians, who have reed boats also, could have sailed across to South America, where reed boats show up in the Lake Titicaca Basin and on the coast of Peru. Um, so this would be that other link of this master race that comes out of the, the Middle East, crosses the Atlantic, settles in the Andes, and then finally ends up in Polynesia. This was... Um, in 69, uh, uh, there was a first boat. Um, it was a disaster. It took on too much water, soaked it up, and sank. Um, the second boat he built very quickly, this time with Aymara boat builders from Lake Titicaca, Bolivia, and had a successful journey, very fairly fast and a maneuverable boat um, to show that you could cross um, the Atlantic in indigenous technology. Boat going through some of the waves, um, fairly large boat. His last project, or last significant project, was in Tucumé in the north coast of Peru. And he fell in love with this area, um, mainly because of the Peruvian horses that he liked. Um, so he bought a house there, a large hacienda, I think, and lived there for a number of years. And um, sponsored an archaeological excavation here, which is a very uh, key one in interpreting South American prehistory. Um, he was fascinated because he thought this civilization was the ones that were probably producing those balsa rafts and doing the economy, moving goods up and down the coast, um, maybe as far north as Mexico. This shows a mural um, in low relief of a frieze showing some indigenous designs um, um, depicting um, large boats uh, with bird-like figures um, uh, standing on them, probably on the ocean. And the success of this project and why it's so well respected, he had two, uh, he had three, two great archaeologists, colleagues of mine, um, who worked on this. And he gave them free reign to do great archaeology, lots of funding. And they got to publish their stuff the way they wanted to. And then he could extract what he liked out of it, kind of pick and choose to argue his arguments uh, to further his, um, his, his ideas. Um, um, he published numerous books. In, in his life. I, I tried to count them, and I couldn't get a count. Um, there, many of these are literally large volumes um, in size. And they're big format, um, huge word count, total page numbers, filled with excellent quality photographs, uh, some of the first color photographs used in archaeology, maps, technical drawings. And, um, but you, you see, though, if you look at a lot of these, you see a lot of repetition, especially in the later works, uh, just kind of repeating what he's already said. But he was a master storyteller. And um, 
uh, and from what I understand, he was a master speaker at, at events where he could sort of um, tell his story. So some of the scholarly critique, um, his ideas are not very popular today, as, at least in the professional scholarly world. And um, even though um, he was a darling of the press and a lot of his biographers treat him almost like a, a human god, um, there's a lot of old and new reevaluations of his theories that are highly critical, especially regarding Polynesia and Indian culture history. Some of his critique can be quite harsh at times uh, from armchair scholars, but also practicing professionals that have all chimed in to critique various aspects of his work. But in some ways, that shows how seriously he was taken, because archaeologists wouldn't spend the time to address these things and disagree if they didn't think it was um, worth discussing. And um, I think that um, you know, some of his success was actually going through this debate process. Um, his American Indians in the Pacific book in 1952 got the most criticism. That was an 821-page book, lots of text and, and illustrations. And um, his supporters would say, well, mainstream science is just too conservative and too traditional to accept his big ideas. And um, you know, he would argue that they're too focused on the minutia, you know, the archaeological data, the pottery, the plant remains, the architecture of your site, rather than the big picture of big human histories, he would say. Um, and it would be actively resisted by the powers that be. But based on my readings, uh, most of the weaknesses, but he took traits out of context and compared them sort of item by item. So kind of scanning through art books, photography books, kind of picking and choosing, and then sort of pairing them with objects, say, from Polynesia, taken from all over Polynesia, and, but mainly Easter Island, to sort of prove the connections. And um, in many cases, he just completely resisted any critique of his, of his ideas. And I think all of us, I mean, I love to get in debates with my colleagues, but I also, one of the things I love about debating is the world isn't completely known, and so it's, you know, you discuss, you debate with your colleagues, but you also learn from your colleagues. And I think that um, this was one of his, um, his main downfalls. Um, he had trouble also, I think, kind of ranking the quality of the evidence that he used to make his arguments. Sometimes it was very superficial comparisons of art styles, iconography, design of architecture, sculpture, and actual artifacts. And um, although he developed his ideas and kind of fine-tuned them throughout his life, it kind of remained the same story that he presented to the, um, the New York scholars uh, trying to get his first book published before Contiki. Uh, very entrenched in his ways, even though he expanded it out with projects um, all into the old world and many other areas in the new world. Now, um, so due to his self-proclaimed maverick or outsider status in science, um, he, you know, he refused to adapt and sharpen his arguments. And um, the sort of failure to participate with regular science, you know, we have peer reviewing of proposals, we have peer reviewing of books. He did publish some books with major presses that were probably peer reviewed. But these things can really help you sharpen your argument. Even if your critics don't agree with you, you figure out ways to better address the critique. And, um, he worked so hard you know, for this idea, at least his idea, of scientific legitimacy that he really probably never, um, never got. Um, part of um, the more recent critique um, points out kind of the dark side of a lot of his ideas. And um, this was this idea of a white race, a civilized white race kind of taking civilization and introducing it to other parts of the world, um, such as the Andes. You know, and the idea here is they couldn't develop it on their own, had to come from somewhere else. Um, or the case of Polynesia being settled by these folk later generations crossing the Pacific. And um, he used these images over and over and over again. These are moche pots from about 500 AD, um, and supposedly depicting um, ancient Peruvians with hair, um, and so Peruvians tend to not have much facial hair. Um, and he argued that you know, this guy's little goatee and the beard on this guy was evidence um, of, you know, physical evidence of this race that had colonized South America and later Polynesia. Um, 
Now, does, does his ideas that some people have actually called racist, um, do they just reflect the times you know, that he had? Um, his new biographer, Axel Anderson, points out probably not. I mean, he, this was post-World War II, and part of the reason the war was fought was because of the racism and ethnocide that was occurring in Europe. And um, you know, that was becoming even more aware of the public after the war. And um, he was aware. He was aware of these critiques um, uh, early in his career, but he, he ignored them. And some of the implications of a lot of his theory that people pointed out is the, essentially he's saying that the indigenous peoples of the Americas and Polynesia were incapable of developing civilization on their own and had to be taught by more knowledgeable outsiders. And in some ways, this you know, also denies native peoples of their own accomplishments in monumental architecture, engineering, technology, astronomy, and art. Now, did Thor Heyerdahl directly uh, impact and result in Native peoples losing their lands, their rights, their resources? No, but um, much of the world still sort of supports um, this kind of dark side of hyper-diffusionism. And the, there's a lot of popular literature on this. If you can go to any bookstore, even the Penn bookstore, and look under archaeology or cult or religion, you'll see uh, uh, finding you know, examples, maybe multiple books on these topics that are quite popular. Um, some of the um, comparisons that he used in some of his books of um, modern day peoples on um, the island, Easter Island. You know, Easter Island had a lot of people visiting it through the colonial period, um, intermarrying, and most of the people were taken off the island as slaves and to uh, mine the guano. Um, uh, islands off of Peru for fertilizer, and then people reintroduced to it. So a lot of this really doesn't hold up that well. Now, let's look at just briefly at the end here to kind of summarize some new work um, and some new publications that say that maybe Heyerdahl was correct about the possible Trans-Pacific contact, but maybe in the opposite direction. And I learned about this at the Society for American Archaeology meetings in 2010. Uh, there was a morning and afternoon session um, well attended, big auditorium almost twice the size of this, and um, lots and lots of discussion of new research being done along the Pacific coast, but in particular Chile. A lot of this work focuses on Mocha Island, 30 kilometers off the Chilean coast, where a number of skeletal remains and crania have been found from pre-Columbian sites that are said to match Polynesian features. Now, this is kind of a dangerous thing to be comparing a you know, handful of skulls to sort of um, recreate you know, the connections across to Polynesia. But it's not just this. And um, in addition, on the coast, not far from here, is a site called Arenal, where they found chicken bones. Chickens, you know, who cares about chickens? Well, there's this long-standing debate whether chickens were brought in by Europeans uh, from the Old World and distributed throughout the Americas. It, you know, it's an incredible animal, uh, very easy to keep, um, eats almost everything, you know, doesn't require a lot of work, it produces great meat, great eggs. And so um, you, know, you can see why any culture that had access to it would probably adopt it. And, um, but er all the accounts, there aren't a lot of accounts, but accounts were dismissed of any pre-Columbian possibility that they were in the Americas before. And the consensus was outside. This new site has great archaeological context to show that, um, that the dates that are between 1300 AD and 1450, late prehistory, um, that are in different strata with chicken bones that are dated, that can tell us that, that these were probably either a settlement there, that they haven't determined that, or multiple peoples from Polynesia may have been coming to this island over uh, quite a long period of time. Alice Story, um, just an incredible publisher, she just got a couple of articles last week or the week before that I read. Um, she's looking at the DNA of chickens and documenting them to try to distinguish the Asian chicken from the African chicken and figure out which routes. She's arguing that it was the Asian chicken that ends up on these sites in Chile. Um, there's some other scholars that are arguing against her, but it shows sort of the power of debate and the you know, marshalling of evidence and making different arguments. Interesting material traits, and I can only just summarize a couple here, uh, some of the more interesting ones. Um, so on the top are New Zealand, Maori, um, what are called hand clubs, about this big. 
been kind of heavy, uh, probably used for ritual purposes, but they could have been used in hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, used in all kinds of rituals in Polynesia, especially um, in New, New Zealand. And then at the bottom are ones from Chile. Now, the problem here, as far as I know, none of these have good archaeological context. They're, they're in museums and stuff. And they're associated with a culture called the Mapuche, which speak a very different language from all of the other languages in the Andes. And they're very independent people. They were the only uh, ethnic group that resisted the Inca Empire and held out against them, um, battle after battle after battle. Um, on the right is one from our incredible collection from Polynesia, a uh, very fancy one uh, made of whalebone. Also, these uh, were called celts. They're kind of like heavy, um, they're probably adzes for uh, doing woodworking, maybe as hatchets um, or axe heads. And some of them probably were just ritual, but they have a very distinctive polished shape. Um, and um, the name in both Maipuche and also Polynesia is Tokai. Now, could be that we know that slaves from Easter Island and probably other islands were dragged to South America to do work for the Spaniards various times. So it could be they brought these things with them, kind of hard to believe slaves would bring it. Um, uh, or this could have been, you know, uh, after, after the world was known um, that Polynesian travelers, you know, know, we know that South America is there, so we'll go and sort of distribute these things. Also, along the Pacific coast, there's a very distinctive form of fish hook. They're about this big, probably for deep sea fishing. And it's kind of remarkable. The shapes and sizes are made of sometimes of wood, sometimes of stone, if you can believe it, and then also of shell. Um, and so you can see the differences there uh, between the two areas, Polynesia and California, and they show kind of remarkable similarity. And then also the sewn plank boat. And it's Pretty rare in the Americas. The Chumash of Southern California um, near the Channel Islands have um, this. No other society on the Pacific Coast has this. They use reed boats instead. And so it kind of stands out as a distinctive trait. It's also only found in Southern Chile along the coast, another area of suspected Polynesian landfall. Terry Jones has written about this and working with a colleague who's a linguist has found all kinds of names and similarities um, of the boat parts and things with Polynesian languages. I find this a little less convincing. But you can see some of the differences in the boats. Um, the California ones tend to be much smaller than the Polynesian boats. So what they're arguing here is that Polynesian peoples, not not these white races from sailing out con contiki um, style, uh, came, landed in southern Chile. Why southern Chile? It's because the most direct route along the currents and the southern route, it's a very cold route, the currents will take you right to the south coast of Chile. And then you could just easily take the Humboldt Current, which roars up to the north. You go offshore a little bit, it just takes you up to Ecuador. And from there, load up your boat, and take off the same way Hyrule did across back to Polynesia. And the idea, you know, the speculation is that you know, they did this multiple times, not just once, and they lived to tell about it. Now, it needs a lot of work. We've got to find the settlements associated with these. You've got to find more of the materials in archaeological context. So in some ways, it suffers from many of the same problems that Thor Heyerdahl's arguments have. And I've even seen his name mentioned in a lot of the critiques of some of their popular work that come out. But the difference here, I think, is these are scholars, archaeologists, geneticists, um, art historians, linguists, who are participating with the scientific field, publishing in peer-reviewed journals, and getting critiqued right and left, and producing more and more and more evidence to try to make their point. I think it's a very different kind of trajectory than um, Thor Heyerdahl. So to conclude, um, Thor Heyerdahl was a worldwide celebrity. And some people have pointed out that his expeditions were equivalent to European exploration, exploration of the New World or more recent space exploration in the 1960s and 70s. Great journeys into the unknown, lots of unpredictable factors, technology that could fail, and a probability of being lost and maybe even death. Um, but there were appreciations for indigenous knowledge, engineering, navigation skills, astronomy, marine technology, survival skills, and probably more important, um, storage techniques to be able to take enough food and water with you. Um, and if you sort of take these sort of outside of some of the criticism that was raised about his racism, um, he contributed quite a bit. 
Um, being a big thinker, he not only thought big on a geographic scale, but also a temporal scale, sometimes maybe too much. For me, um, the, best, the best stuff was the experimental archaeology. And he really showed what could be done using indigenous technology um, recorded from the historical records, from some archaeological evidence, but it doesn't really say what actually happened in the past or its implications. And for me, a lot of this is, um, I think, the interesting parts of some of his whimsical writing about sort of how, what he feels like when he's writing Contiki and some of his other explorations is um, this sort of sense of, you know, you think about, well, if, if you don't know where you're going, you land on a beach, are the people going to welcome us or are they going to eat us? Um, or, or more likely probably enslave you. Um, and how are you going to convince them, not knowing their language, you know, that you're okay and you could live with them, restock your boat, maybe make, continue with your journey. And um, what kind of knowledge would be exchanged? What, what would be permanent changes in these kinds of contacts? And what would be things that would be just sort of be dismissed? Oh, yeah, there's some weird people came here and spoke a different language. They had a great boat, cool boat, you know, and they left. Um, so we really don't know. Um, but there have been many copycat expeditions. I Copycat. That some of these were exploring new realms or new areas of Heyerdahl. Um, exploration, but um, you can see some of the major ones here. Uh, this is uh, sort of a cottage industry, um, probably big money too, of expeditions. Uh, there's one um, just fairly recently, I think in 2012. This is my favorite though, Plastiki. So this was a boat made of plastic bottles, uh, the kind, you know, you dump in landfills. And it was meant as an environmental protest. Um, so it actually floats as a catamaran built of it's empty, empty, you know, milk jugs and things. And um, it was to sail up through the debris deposited by the tsunami from Japan that drifted across the ocean, another example of how things can move, ended up on the coast of Alaska and Western Canada. And um, this was meant to be a, a political statement, but a cool, cool one. Now, um, Heyerdahl, later in life, was also an outspoken uh, proponent of the environment and very anti-war. And one of his last expeditions with the Tigris going through the southern uh, Middle East, he was not allowed to put port in, uh, land in any port along the route um, because of the ongoing conflicts there. And um, he actually burned his boat in protests um, um, for you know, the problems of war. He died um, in 1980, say, age of 87. Um, in Italy of a brain tumor, um, and he has incredible ongoing popularity. Um, he has, you know, descendants that are actually explorers too, um, and followers that have been actively managing his legacy um, in Norway and throughout the world. This is the Thor Heyerdahl um, um, Museum in uh, Norway. Many of his uh, books are still in print today, and um, I don't know how, how many versions of uh, Contiki there are, but it's probably I mean, it's 20th or 30th edition. I go around my shelves of my colleagues, usually the senior colleagues, look at their bookshelves in their office or at home. You can always find four or five of Thor Heyerdahl books on their shelf. Um, even in death, he lives on. Um, so there was the Hollywood film that many of you might have seen, a uh, Norwegian-produced film, 2012, Contiki, that covers um, the, the journey, the preparation and the journey of Contiki, not the rest of his life. Um, the Contiki book um, was published in 70 different languages, and they estimate some 50 million copies were sold worldwide. So I highly recommend reading it if you want to escape from your lives. Thank you. <laughs>